Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. As you folks have come to know, I'm a bit of a classic rock junkie, as it were. And a band going back, way back, Danny Moses, consisted of the following performers. Stephen Stills, Neil Young, Dewey Martin, Jim Messina. And for you old timers, Richie Fure, and I will tell you, those are the members of Buffalo Springfield. By the way, you're listening to the On The Tape podcast. I am Guy Adami, always joined by Dan Nathan and Danny Moses, except this week, Dan Nathan is on vacation, well-deserved, much-needed vacation, but he's stuck around to have a conversation with us, with the great Terry Duffy, the CEO of CME Group, so stick around for that. But the reason I mentioned Buffalo Springfield, Danny, as you probably know, one of their great songs is For What It's Worth. And There's something happening here. It's exactly right. There's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear. Well, if you've listened to the On The Tape podcast, it's been crystal clear for Danny Moses for quite some time. And as we sit here on this Thursday afternoon, obviously a lot can change by this time tomorrow. But the S&P is now below that 200-day moving average. We're looking at 3930 or so in the S&P. Dow Jones down 400 and change. The NASDAQ giving it up a bit as well. And Danny, we have a VIX that's now north of 21. So we're going to have a great conversation with Terry Duffy. We're going to talk about some of the things that he's talking about and he's seeing. He wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times that we will discuss But what strikes you, I mean, other than the obvious, the market, there are a lot of things under the surface, Danny, that are absolutely concerning. Everybody look what's going down. Everything's going down. So, all right, except the VIX guy, to your point. So there's a couple things that are happening here. Let's start with the most recent and work our way backwards. Effectively, we've had a bank failure for the most part with Silvergate. And people said, okay, that was crypto, only not a big deal. Some of those crypto clients went to Signature Bank, SBNY. You can see what's happening to that stock. So people believe that they might be in trouble. And then basically late yesterday, you had Silicon Valley Bank. Kudos to Jim Chanos, Porter Collins, Vincent Daniel, and the lost art of single stock shorting and really doing bottom-up analysis of understanding that, again, yes, it's a bank. Yes, it's insured by the FDIC. They should be fine. Except when you have duration mismatch, what does that mean, Danny? When the term of your assets does not match your liabilities. And remember, for a bank, your liabilities are the deposits because you owe those back to the customers. Well, in the case of Silicon Valley, just to cut to the chase here, Guy, it was a lot of venture capital type companies, right, in Silicon Valley itself, that who are their clients? Well, what's happened for the last six to 12 months is the capital markets have not been available to them. So they've been, quote, draining cash out of those accounts. Silicon Valley doesn't have that traditional banking customer. We think about it, Bank America, JP Morgan, et cetera. Well, what does Silicon Valley try to do? They try to take those deposits and earn as much interest as they can. They made a big mistake by assuming that those deposits would stay with the company. And they went out and they bought, help me here, guy, a lot of fixed income securities, (laughs) mortgage-backed Mm -hmm. securities, treasuries, and long dated. And it wasn't that long ago. $21 $21 billion portfolio, effectively, they were forced to sell. We won't go into the risk metrics. Banks have to adhere to various things, obviously, stress tests, et cetera. Effectively, took almost a $2 billion hit 
on treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And General Atlantic's putting money in the company. They're doing a, an equity offering, right? Overnight, this happens. And the stock at this point, as we sit here, is halted, where it's trading down 60% or so. And guy, that was a $16, $18 billion bank, literally. So that's company-specific, right? Maybe. And then you have First Republic Bank. So here's what's happening, guy. And I'll bring it back to where I want to go. Flashbacks of 2008 and 2009. Is it different this time? Yes, for sure. This is not a, quote, credit event. This is a product mismatch event. And I think that we are now finally starting to see what we've been talking about, Guy, and Dan's been talking about is what is the impact of quantitative tightening? Or more or less, what is the impact of no quantitative easing? And you are now seeing it. And you are seeing it in full form at this point. So I'll end with this, Guy. What do portfolio managers do, whether you're a long only or a hedge fund at this moment? You call your salesperson, your institutional salesperson, you say, hey, run me a screen on banks that are heavy in mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. Let me see those. And that's what's going on today. So you're going to see an overreaction, I'm certain, in some banks. But here we are. And for Sheila Bear, and it may be better if you read her quote today, not the ghost of Sheila Bear, Sheila Bear herself, who people don't remember, ran the FDIC back during the financial crisis. This is about Silvergate itself. Now, Silvergate, we all know, is the crypto bank that's basically going to fail. Silvergate's troubles are as much, if not more, about traditional banking risks, lack of diversification, maturity mismatches, as it is about its exposure to crypto, said Sheila Bear. So I think, Guy, there's a little bit of that coming to the market and other things. We'll talk about Powell in a minute and testifying you know, in front of Congress and so forth, which you previewed last week. But to me, it's this, hold on a second, shake me. Are we really back to where we were? And I want to go in after you make a comment here, Guy, about Jamie Dimon yes. and what he said yesterday. So. Which is really important. I want to hear what your thoughts are because some striking comments out of Jamie Dimon, but Silicon Valley Bank, for you playing our home game, the symbol there, which you've probably figured out by now, is SIVB. And I mention this because, again, it doesn't necessarily matter where things were, but I point this out just for emphasis, Danny. This was a 700 and $50 stock in October of 2021, when seemingly nothing was going to go wrong. I don't think it's coincidental that it topped out just around the same time that the Fed did their pivot and started to raise rates. So as valuations went from not mattering to mattering, and a lot of these overnight millionaires had to take a long, hard look in the mirror, and maybe they weren't necessarily millionaires anymore, it all come cascading down into what we're seeing today, a stock that is being halted right around $100 or so a share, which is unbelievable. We're talking about the move of about 69% in a single day move. Now, people will listen to this and say, well, it's Silicon Valley specific. This is not a small company. This still with the move is probably north of $7.5 billion market cap company. So not insignificant by any stretch of the imagination. And I emphasize this because it just goes to show you how quickly things can go pear-shaped in the world we live in, Danny Moses. Yeah. And let me bring it back to autonomous analyst John McDonald had a Zoom yesterday with Jamie Dimon. I think there was 20 or 30 investors on the call just giving a State of the Union on the bank itself and the banking industry. And Dwight Collins, who I nicknamed Dwightness, uh, who is Porter Collins' brother, is a salesman there and was nice enough to forward the note to me. And- Jamie Dimon really painted not a bleak picture, but a very realistic picture of what's happening out there. And he is seeing the impact of the end of quantitative easing. He is seeing the impact of deposits leaving, funding, and so forth. So credit quality is fine. But again, this is about not understanding the products or the investors not really understanding what the risks are. We've read about for the last several weeks deposits, draining. You're no longer going to keep your money in a checking account that's earning nothing. You're going to go to a CD. We can see it in the reverse repo. We can see that growing literally by the day. The danger here, Guy, is that when banks no longer want to lend to each other, where do they go? And they go to this reverse repo, right? That's where money market funds kind of go. Well, so stop for a second because yes, that's exactly what happens. And I would say, and I've brought this up a number of times, it was September 17th, I think, and please don't at me if I'm off by a day, but this was the fall before COVID when the overnight repo market effectively blew up. And, and when I say blew up, I'm choosing those words carefully because that's what happened. And I said at the time, Danny, you mentioned it on our podcast that, wait a second, 
there's something going on here. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. It was clear to us. I will tell you that nobody talked about it. Nobody made a big deal about it. But that was the initial markings to me that something was amiss or something was a bit askew in the piping of the system. And now you're bringing it up again for good reason. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but please continue. This is from McDonald's note. All in Diamond thinks we're in the early innings of QT, quantitative tightening. Despite system reserves already being down, ready for this, 27% since year in 2021 and commercial bank deposits being down over 800 billion since their peak in April, 2022. And he put a chart in here of bank reserves versus the RRP, the reverse repo facility. And they're starting to converge. And that's the scary part. It's not so much like last time, run on the bank, don't be concerned. And you know, I don't want to alarm people, but again, the art of stock picking, and I will say from firsthand knowledge, there aren't many hedge funds out there left with dedicated financial service, long, short teams. There's not. You got Porter and Vinia doing on the side. You got Chanos. There are a handful that are out there, but there was not a lot of dedicated people. Guy, the same way that energy was kind of a lost art a couple years ago. But here's the bigger picture. Let me pull it back. Who's the leader in this market now? That's what's the most concerning thing to me. Is it tech? No, it's not tech. Is it financials? Obviously not. Is it energy? Not if oil keeps acting like this. Where is a leadership going to come from? Could it be industrials? Sure, at a price. Is it consumer discretionary? I don't think so with rates going where they're insane. So help me understand because that's the part that's actually should scare people is what can you own here? Now, yields are dropping obviously today. And now we'll say one other thing. We're going to go through a period now <laughs> where people are going to root for bad economic data. Bad is good. You know how long that's going to last? An hour, a day, or a week at the most. Meaning, yeah, jobless claims went up today. We can go through that and big acceleration and continuing claims, et cetera. So we're starting to ramp back up again. And honestly, we talked about it last week. I think the stagflationary type of environment is coming back to us. And now what? Because, okay, maybe the Fed doesn't go 50 in the next meeting in a few weeks. And let's talk about Powell's testifying here in a second. But so what? They're not cutting anytime soon. That we know. So now you're left with, what do I own? What does the system look like? What are my inputs? And when you have a thing like this, sorry to stress about the banks here, but this is such a financialized economy, it's really important that people understand without me getting too wonky, it's pretty logical, right? What a bank owns, what they lend out and what they're forced to sell. And so believe me, we're gonna have a bunch of hearings again. One last thing, Guy, I talked about this a few months ago. There's something called the supplementary leverage ratio, or as you like to call it, Guy? The SLR. Correct. So during COVID, the Fed relax the standards for banks. What is the SLR? The SLR is how much capital do you have to hold against your treasuries, so to speak? And they allowed it obviously to drop during that time period because they wanted the banks to be healthy. They wanted, you know, obviously for banks to have that type of liquidity. Watch what happens. I said this would probably happen at some point. I believe the SLR will get relaxed again, in my opinion, because the last thing the banking system wants, right, is to have this crisis right now. So keep an eye on that. SLR, that's what I got, guy. So right now, so we're clear, neither Danny nor myself are suggesting that there's anything necessarily systemic for some of these other banks. I want to be crystal clear. But with that said, if you're not paying attention to what's going on at Silicon Valley Bank, you're just not paying attention. And to me, it's one of those anecdotal things that it's part of this mosaic that we've been trying to weave or this pastiche, whatever it is you want to call it. And people will say, you guys are just cherry picking the negative stuff, which is true to a point. But the problem, of course, is there's been so much negative stuff out there to cherry pick from. We're just choosing to shine a light on it. Now, people will say, well, bad news is going to be good news. Danny just made that point. And just let me say again, we do this on Thursday. So by the time you're listening to this, chances are there's another set of numbers that are out that could steer this market one way or another. I want to be clear on that as well. But what I will say here on this Thursday, prior to the market opening, we had this jobs number come out and it was a bad number, bad in terms of the numbers were going higher. Jobless claims were rising. The market initially took that as good news. And we saw a spike in the market. Of course, the problem is, to Danny's earlier point, bad news can be good news, but for how long? Because at a certain point, bad news is actually bad news. So it's just something to keep in consideration here. And again, when you hear Jamie Dimon make comments like that, 
you can't just, when he's bullish, just take what he says as rote. And you know what? He's our leader here. And then when he says something that's counter to your dogma or to the way you want to think, say, we're going to discount Jamie because he's the same guy that's been bearish on crypto and talking about hurricanes and all those other things. When people of that magnitude speak, Danny, you have to listen. And your point about people no longer being designated to do these things, you're 100% right. And part of the problem is because in a world where passive investing took over, you didn't need stock pickers and you didn't need people that did the work. And guys like Porter and Vinny and you and Jim Chanos, I don't want to say you were rendered obsolete, but I will tell you to a certain extent, you were rendered extraordinarily frustrated. Now your expertise is coming to the forefront. Yeah, I'm sitting in this chair instead of sitting on a trading desk. But anyway, I want to go over a couple of things that you just went through. Let me back up a week ago. We had Tom Lee on and we felt as a group, let's get a bull on so we can hear the other side. It's healthy. And I gave him a little bit of shit for his thesis of 2022 was a down year, but if the first five days of January are up 1.4%, and I said, I can cherry pick a bearish argument like you can bullish, but this is the irony. He said March 7th was going to be an inflection point. Now, he thought it would be a bullish inflection point. I'll give him credit. He was dead right. It was definitely an inflection point by Powell speaking, which again, I promise we're going to get to. But I read Peter Bookvar. I know I quote him almost weekly at this point because I think it's really important that people, whether you believe a person has a bullish or bearish view, to just read the facts. And you alluded, Guy, to continuing claims and initial jobless claims that are starting to get back to kind of 2009 levels and we're starting to acceleration. Listen to this. In February, job cuts occurred in all 30 industries. That's the challenger data. That's the first time since January 2013. Just want you to put that in perspective. What was happening in January 2013? QE2, QE3, we were starting that process. So obviously we kind of evolved out of that. Today, GM announces buyouts. By the way, that's job cuts just for everyone out there. To all of their 58,000 US employees that have been with the company for more than five years. Okay, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of white collar workers as well. Yes, they'll get paid and they'll go on their way, but they're cutting. That's a $2 billion type cut they're doing. Meta, again, the stock was awarded the other day for cuts. Okay, they're doing the right thing, right? And we said all along that Meta was kind of turning into a value stock from a growth stock at some point. So this stuff, guy, is my point about bad being good. And I think bad is going to start to be bad for the realization that the difference of the Fed's terminal rate of being 6%, 5.7, 5.5, or when they may cut, it's going to be a little too late for things that feel like they're going to start to get cemented in here. And I don't think anyone's going to be overly comfortable when we go start to report Q1 earnings here in mid-April, especially, Guy, what industry reports first always is the banks. And so back to the forefront, you're going to see a lot of notes. And again, I don't think there's a lot of education in the marketplace. And so this could get really interesting. And Guy, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you because we previewed last week that Powell was going to be testifying in front of Congress. And I think it's important. And let's talk put- about that. And just to tie a bow on bad news being good news, or you can't cost cut your way to prosperity. I mean, you've mentioned a few companies. I'll mention one more. And this is not dog pile on the rabbit stuff because I said it that night on Fast Money. When Disney reported, the stock, I think, went from about 108-ish, maybe a bit lower than there, traded all the way up to 121. And it did it on the back of effectively cost cuts. And I said it on the show. I said, look, it's great for the bounce. And I understand why people are getting excited. I said, but this is not a long-term strategy that's going to pay off. Maybe in the short term, you got some of the people off your back, guys like Nelson Peltz off your back. And effectively, it did, but it's not a long-term growth strategy. And then we've subsequently seen what's happened there. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, Buffalo Springfield, let me just say this. I told you about there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Now we'll get to the Jerome Powell portion of this conversation. There's a man with a gun over there (laughs) telling me I've got to beware. That's exactly right. Jerome Powell's been that guy with the proverbial gun in his hand in terms of what he's doing with the balance sheet and what he's doing with rates. And he's been telling us, the market participants, to beware for quite some time, Danny Moses. Yeah, again, preview last week, I don't think a lot of people were really talking about it. That was a Fed press conference. And you and I talked about this on Market Call 
I believe on Tuesday it had just occurred. And that's what it was. I mean, he was literally reading his notes again, same type thing. Whatever questions were coming, he wasn't answering. He was just reading what he was going to say. So that was an interfed fed meeting. They're going to be coming out again on March 22nd, but certainly more hawkish. We thought that's what it would be coming into it. And so I think, yes, it was somewhat expected, but to watch fed fund futures trade from a 30% chance of 50 basis points the next meeting to 60 to 70 in the course of a few hours is just nuts in the sense of, is the market that caught off guard? Because we had seen what the inflationary readings, and I just think things are kind of finally getting cemented and the piece of the puzzle that we've been looking for to kind of all come together. Now, when this puzzle does come together and if the market does go down, be ready to buy things. Don't run away. Like there will be great opportunities. I am certain without looking at a screen right now, there are certain banks that are being oversold. I can guarantee there's banks being oversold. We talk about ETFs. You just alluded to passive investing. This is why you can't just go out and buy an XLF for your financial exposure. There's so many different companies in there, as we've talked about all the time, that are exposed to different things, different industries. But you know, right now, Guy, we've been in the industry for a long time. We worked on Wall Street, I think, cumulatively together for 450 years, whatever it's been. <laughs> You know that it's not just Jamie Dimon and Moynihan and all these guys. They're calling their desks right now. What do we have? Are we okay? What do we need to sell? What do we need to hedge? Because the last thing, remember, there's banks and there's Wall Street banks. They don't want Washington crawling up their ass again. And it may be inevitable. So this timing of this is not, it's never great, but it's certainly not great as we get to the last part of the first quarter. And these marks are going to not look great. So you're going to see a lot of announcements, banks saying, we're fine. Look out for the word liquidity. That was always, <laughs> that was the joke during Bear Stearns. We have ample liquidity. Watch what they say. It's very important. Well, that's exactly right, Danny. You're going to start hearing words like systemic again, liquidity again. To your earlier point, you're going to start hearing about leverage again. And you're right. I mean, this is an environment where the risk management portion of these banks, it's sell first ask questions later. And JP Morgan, just for context, I mean, the stock as I'm sitting here on a Thursday afternoon is either side of $130, which makes it now lower for the year. I think it started the year around 133. So we're trading at levels we last saw in December. And it's not to pick on JP Morgan. I mean, I'm sure I can pull out a number of other banks as well that are trading poorly. But for those that thought the banks could lead us out of this to Danny's earlier point, well, somewhat problematic right now in this environment. And again, if you listen to this show, if you watch Fast Money, if you listen to Market Call, any number of different things. Danny's talked about it. I've talked about it. And I think we started bringing it up last summer, the potential for the yield curve, twos, tens in this instance, to go out to an inversion of 100 basis points. Well, it happened pretty quickly this week, Danny. As a matter of fact, for a period of time, it didn't stop at 100. It actually went out to almost 110 basis points, I think, at one point in time. Now, some strange things are going to start to happen in the bond market, I think. And there will be people that will construe it as bullish. To your point, yields actually have come in a bit. But is that necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? That's the problem that we're going to have to start to figure out. Because I would submit, if you see 10-year yields, which again, were north of 4%, at one point, if they start backing up again, doesn't to me mean that things are all that good. As a matter of fact, and you've said this a number of times, there's a scenario where if yields start going lower, it's actually worse. Yeah, you're seeing a reaction today in the two year. When you start to see things in the banking system, you know the Fed, that's in their purview. That's their backyard, literally, front yard, actually. And so people say, well, if they have to do something to quote rescue or alleviate some of the stresses of the banking system, that's what they will do in some form of a program. And so that can cause that. But as I watch here, there was a brief time yesterday, I guess in the morning where, I don't know where we are right now, a guy, 100 basis points on the 210, but the 10-year yield was actually moving a little higher and the two-year yield was basically flat. And to me, if you were a person that wanted to be long the market, that's the kind of stuff that you kind of want to start to see because it indicates, as you just mentioned, what could potentially be a soft landing. So Right now, the two-year, as we sit here, I think is down, I don't know if you have it up in front of your facts and machine, but it's probably down 12, 13 basis points right now. But the point is that that is going to happen, but that will stop being, quote, bullish or as a sign to the market, because I believe it's a sign that the Fed is going to have to react to some of the, not crisis, but the stuff that we're excited to see. So yes, it's a tool. It's certainly something to watch. And I will tell you, you don't get to 110 basis point inversion 
without there being something bad on the horizon. Somebody is expecting something. So again, fixed income, always ahead of equities, keep an eye on it. And to your point, guy, even if it gets back to 50 basis point or 60, it's not a green sign at all. It's not a sign to go buy stock. So pay attention. It should be quite interesting. And listen, pressure on treasuries in general and mortgage-backed securities and mortgage spreads if banks indeed are going to be selling because guess what? There is no QE. The Fed's not buying. So who are the natural buyers of those prices? So a lot in that guy, I know, and it's very confusing. No, but it's all important stuff. And people listen to this podcast. Hopefully they listen to some of the things I say. I know they listen for Dan, but I know categorically they listen for you because they realize they've come to understand that you're one of the people out there that's doing the rigorous work and taking the time to read through some of this bullshit, which is sometimes extraordinarily boring, but almost as boring as it is important. And that's why you bring it to the forefront. And I'll say this, you know, now you have Goldman Sachs sounding the alarm bells. I mean, they put out a piece warning that higher Fed rates could lead to a sharp, their words, not mine, so often stocks. So now you have some of these obviously important banks making comments that we've been making for quite some time. But let me sort of amplify something that you said. And it's important. I want to talk about this a little bit. You said that there are going to be opportunities out there, which I agree with you. Now, here's the problem for a lot of people. Now, if I had said, I'll make an example. You're going to have a chance to buy JP Morgan at $110. Would you sign up for it? And most people would say, yes, sign me up right now. Of course, the problem is if and when it gets there, it's going to look really scary. And you're going to be like, holy shit, I can't buy anything here because the world is coming to an end. Well, first of all, the world's not coming to an end. For those of you betting that the sun's going to explode, if you're right, we're all screwed. So let's just back that out for a second. What I'm trying to illustrate here, though, is you have to have a plan when you find yourself in the environment that I think both Danny and I think we're entering. And by the way, as I mentioned, we're going to talk to Terry Duffy in a few minutes, and I think he's probably going to sort of build upon some of the things that we've been talking about. I mentioned this because you have to have a plan for stocks. So if there's a wish list out there that you have, whether it's energy, technology, healthcare, banks, whatever it is, once you have that plan, stick to the plan. Because I will tell you from experience, when it gets to the levels that you want it to get to, it's always going to be for reasons you never in your wildest dreams could have imagined, Danny. No, for sure. And you're right. Once it gets there, it's like, I wasn't expecting it to get there. I'm not going to buy it here. And that always ends up happening. And yes, I mean, make the list. But again, I think I know where we're going to go in the market. It's going to get a little bit worse from here. But again, that will present opportunities. And like I said, I think sitting on the hands is not a great strategy right now. Meaning, be honest with yourself, if you own something that you know has kind of been over earning, so to speak, and not just from a fundamental basis, from a stock price performance. And as we've talked about on the show, you can get four and a half, five percent risk free effectively. God forbid a debt ceiling problem. That's a whole nother issue, which we won't have time for the show to go into. But is that horrible? No, it's not. So go get some type of return on your product. And again, I think what the Silicon Valley highlights, which is not good, it becomes self fulfilling for the banking industry. Are my deposits safe? Yes, your deposits are safe from the FDIC. Why can't I be earning more? Do I need to move them? Where should I move it to? It will feed on itself. And that was part of Diamond's commentary yesterday. So when you see a poster child like Silvergate and CivB and SBNY and all these things, right, it's a wake-up call. And so, again, every industry has a different challenge, good and bad, and you just got to understand what they are. No, I think that's right. And I've said this. I'm not suggesting this is easy by any stretch of the imagination, but to the extent you can do it, and by the way, having a plan helps a great deal, you need to take emotion out of the equation with this stuff. And I understand people are not necessarily traders, nor did they grow up as traders. They weren't schooled or educated or trained as traders, but you have to try to have that mentality of, I'm going to take emotion out of the equation. I'm going to look for opportunities. I'm going to look for levels that are interesting to me. And Dan and I and Danny have pointed out where we thought the S&P could trade down to. And I'm not going to back away from that. And it's interesting, and I'm not looking to pick on anybody, but in terms of the yield curve, the inversion, you've heard a number of people say, if you watch the network, if you watch business television or read things, it's different this time. And I've actually said, you know what? I agree with you. It is different this time. And one of the things that I've said is it's different this time because it's probably worse. Why? Because the debt levels are absurd in this country. You know, we mentioned this a couple times, but it's worth illustrating again. You know, debt to GDP in the United States is probably approaching 
140% or so, depending on the numbers you use. And I will tell you from going back and reading things, there's no developed country in history that's been able to sort of rebound from those kind of debt levels. So one has to ask themselves how this whole thing shakes out, Danny. Yeah, that's the scary thing, right? If you truly get an economic slowdown, lower tax receipts coming to the government, and you really start to stare at this $32 trillion number, it's scary. And so you see Biden's administration come out today, You know, obviously more just for PR purposes, showing a higher capital gains rate, showing a billionaire's tax, et cetera, things that will probably never get passed. But the point is that that's what you have to kind of put out there to show how you can fix this deficit. So it's going to get really heated, especially if the economy does start to turn down. And I don't know how quickly it's going to, quote, turn down. I just feel like it's done going up. So with unemployment rate, we're going to get tomorrow. I think the last print was 3.4%. I don't know what it's going to be, but I feel like the low is in and there. And just to follow through on the number coming out, it'll be out tomorrow, obviously, after we record. And it doesn't necessarily matter, although there are people out there that say it could be a negative actual print. So the number's 200,000. I don't know what the market's rooting for if you're bullish. I really don't. I really don't at this point, because if it's really hot, that's not good. And if it's really bad, it's like, oh, shit, maybe things are slowing down more. And I think that's the inflection point that we're kind of in here, guys. Yeah, I know it's interesting. And I've said this, and I'll say it again, if there are any new listeners, everybody talks about the Fed put being in the form of the S&P 500, and they try to gauge where that is. And historically, when I say historically, let's just say over the last couple of decades, I think that has been true. I do think the Federal Reserve have been watchers of stocks and watchers of the S&P and have focused on that for a myriad of different reasons. I don't think there's necessarily a Fed put in the form of the S&P. If there is one, I think it's probably 1,000 S&P handles from where we are, so somewhere below 3,000. And that's, by the way, that's not me saying we're going there. I want to be clear. But if you're looking for a Fed put in the stock market, that's probably where it is. The Fed put comes in the form of two things, Danny. The unemployment rate getting to 5%, which by the way, is where they want it to be, if they're being honest, that's number one. Or number two, something like we're seeing today that we just talked about for a few minutes, or the credit market sort of seizing up, which again, I'm not suggesting is happening, but that's the other side of the equation. So those are the things that I would be watching for, Danny. Listen, I'll say it again. This is the era of easy money coming home to roost. You saw it happen in crypto. That was the poster child for easy money, chasing risk and so forth. So again, 13 years of easy money. You have to have repercussions. We've been talking about this ad nauseum since they started talking about QT. And when they started talking about QT, to Jamie Dimon's comments, funds were already, quote, leaving the system. It was already happening. Mortgage-backed securities are widening. People, there's still a $8 trillion or something on the balance sheet of the Fed. And I've been saying for a long time, I think they're going to stop, quote, QT at some point because you cannot drain that much liquidity from the system without these type of repercussions. And this is exactly what's happening. Big Brother is not there to buy this from you. So who is the incremental buyer of this? And that's the problem here, Guy. And it's not a credit issue. It's a leverage and a price issue. And so things are getting repriced really across the globe here. And so that's kind of be a little bit painful. But again, Guy, I want to reiterate this is not the end of the world. This is nothing like the global financial crisis. I know you've said it a few times. I want to make sure that that's clear. But again, be wary is what I would say. So so I agree with everything you said, as I typically do. It's amazing how we line up, and we've only known each other for, I think, four or so years. In some ways, I wish we grew up professionally together. In a lot of ways, it's probably best that we didn't, <laughs> but that's for another podcast. But I hear what you're saying, and I understand what I'm thinking, and I say, all roads continue to lead to gold. Now, the price suggests otherwise, but if you think about what we've spent the last 30 minutes talking about, and if you think about what's going on out there, and then layer on top of that, in 2022, central banks buying gold in record amounts in terms of ounces and dollar amounts. And again, I just saw, once again, the Bank of China bought more gold a month or so ago. It has not manifested itself in the price, but I will tell you, there might be people out there that are bullish gold, but if you look at something that we like at, Danny, called the Commitment of Trader Reports and showing what the positions are out there, I will tell you the market is not long of gold. I know we keep harping on this. Sorry, people, but I think it's really important. We talked last week how it was starting to, quote, act better. I realize that's a relative call. It certainly looks relatively strong today. It's an underowned asset, that is for sure. I get it. It doesn't yield anything, but when you start to see issues in a banking system, the geopolitical stuff heating up, the debt ceiling stuff heating up, and all the things. I don't know what else you would rather 
quote, own. Yes, maybe U.S. Treasuries, except, again, your debt to GDP and so forth. I get it. Is it risk-free? Sure. If it's not risk-free, we have bigger problems, obviously, if U.S. Treasuries aren't risk-free. But it's an under-owned asset for sure. And I think the crypto story, and I'm watching Bitcoin here, and do not lose sight of the fact that it has dropped roughly 15%, I think, recently. I think we're under 21,000 here now on Bitcoin. When you start to think of crypto people not having a place to actually put it anymore, yes, Coinbase and a few other places, and I won't go into that in the weeds on that. But point is that I don't think that whole story again of crypto being a replacement for gold, it's bullshit. Gold is gold. It was around before human civilization. <laughs> it will be around after human civilization. It's the one thing that you can count on, guy. And we should do a podcast, and we will, by the way, we'll do a special drop some of the reservations I have about the gold ETF GLD. But one thing you've talked about, Danny, is if you want to have a position in gold, the way you've been doing it is through something called the PHYS, the Sprott Physical Gold Trust. So I don't want you to necessarily take a deep dive, but I think that if we're both right, this is the instrument that you want to be in, something that obviously is backed by the actual physical gold as opposed to something that's just basically a piece of paper. Yeah, it's a closed-in fund, and they actually own the gold that is part of their net asset value. So yeah, just leave it at that. But you're right, if you own GLD, it's a paper trade exposed to the dollar. If you own PHYS, you know you effectively own the physical gold. So listen, do we want to be in an area where you actually have to go claim that gold and trade your shares in for it? No, I probably don't want to be around for that either. But anyway, leave it at that, and we should get someone. You know what's funny you say that guy? I'm trying to think of like gold experts that are out there. That's how non-bullish people are on gold. I can only think of maybe one or two, and most of them are lunatics. You know, it's the end of the world type gold people. So let's scour and find that for sure, guy. I have a few people in mind. Believe it or not, Danny, there's something each year called the gold dinner, where literally every person that's involved in the gold market comes to New York. The speakers have ranged from Fed officials to people that run central banks to the chairman or the CEO of Newmont Mining. You know who's spoken at the gold dinner twice? Go who? One guy, Christopher Adami, which if you think about the madness of like that. Like I said, where are the experts in gold? We, yeah. You're not kidding. But yes, when is the dinner guy? Do you know when it is? It's usually in the fall. I will find out. Wayne Murdy has spoken at it, but I've spoken at it twice. I should actually post my speech because I think it's somewhere out there in the ether. Yes, guy. But that's neither here nor there. Before we get to Terry Duffy, I'm going to end it with this, Danny. There's battle lines being drawn. Ain't that the truth? Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. And I got to tell you something. That's been the market that we find ourselves in. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people like Danny and myself speaking our minds, getting so much resistance from behind. Ain't that the truth, Danny Moses? Ain't that the truth? No resistance today from Dan Nathan, though. Wherever he might be, no resistance from Dan today. So, hi, Dan. We love you, and we're out. Taking a well-deserved vacation. When we come back, Danny, Dan, and myself, we're going to speak to Terry Duffy, the CEO of CME Group. Stick around. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk. Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. What's up? Guy here. Did you know FactSet is the official data provider for Risk Reversal Media? 
FactSet is the key to all of our analysis. It's not just charts. FactSet provides insight into the top headlines of the day, private markets, and sector-specific data. If you ever have issues, get help from their support team that is committed to your success. Visit FactSet.com to experience the power of FactSet and request a free trial and unlock access to the tools that matter most to you. Well, Terry Duffy, welcome back to the On The Tape podcast. And Dan Nathan, what do they call it when people break the internet? When they say something or write something and it breaks the internet? They call it breaking the internet. Is that what they call it? The last time you were with us, you broke the freaking internet with some of the commentary you made. By the way, prescient comments and extraordinarily timely comments. And we'll talk about that. And we're going to talk about the FT piece. But let's talk about what's going on in the world quickly, because I will tell you, and this is not self-serving, but... The world is really coming around to everything that it's traded on the CME group. I'm watching the bond market trades out of control, obviously what's going on in the commodity markets. But speak to me in terms of what you're seeing uh, from your seat. Guy, first of all, let me thank you, Dan and Danny, uh, for having me on your podcast. Sorry for breaking the internet. But it it couldn't have been on a more topical subject to talk about the break it. What I'm seeing here, Guy, is a lot of uncertainty. I talked yesterday with some folks and I was suggesting that there everything is so tied to the rate market that if whatever people say, it has an impact on every single product because there's a borrowing component to all the different things that we have in this country. So when the Fed talks about rates, it doesn't just affect the equity markets. It affects the energy markets, it affects the commodity markets. It affects everything because of the borrowing component associated with it. So we are seeing a lot of vol every single minute of the day where we used to see that kind of vol over a, you know, a month, a year, but not in the second by second vol that we're seeing today. And people used to like to contribute that to just nothing more than high frequency trading, algorithmic trading. I don't believe that's being the case. I think people are literally confused. We're at price levels that are very dicey that you can see the market go in either direction right now. And it is ultra dependent on a handful of things. And it appears that the Fed is, is such a driving force right now. When you look at all the indexes and the percent that they hold, you know, so many of us hold index funds and the index funds are comprised so heavily on tech companies that it has a big impact on people's livelihoods back and forth or their portfolios, I should say. So we're seeing a lot of people manage that risk in our products. And then we're seeing people that aren't using the products that probably should be using them and still assuming some of that risk on their own balance sheet. To me, that's a very dangerous proposal to assume the risk on your own balance sheet because it's not necessary. You have so many opportunities to lay off risk in a world that's so much cheaper than it was 10, 12 years ago. You know, a lot of people didn't use risk management because of the cost associated with it. Risk management is extremely cheap now because of the deep liquid markets and the cost of doing business is so dramatically different than it was when we were all old floor-based models and things of that nature. So anyway, I'm seeing a lot of different high volatility, you know, new participants globally from around the world. And they're all kind of focused on, uh, I hate to say it, but a singular thing. And that's what the rates are because it had such a big impact globally. Guy just alluded to this on February 28th. You wrote an op-ed in the FT and it was really interestingly timed also when you think about just kind of the seesaw action that we've seen in, in almost every risk asset market. We've had the benefit of talking to you over the course of the last couple of years on our podcast about some of just kind of the new entrance to the market, the, the, the kind of perception that it was just a one-way train, right? So this op-ed was titled, Risk Management is the Alpha for a Time of Uncertainty. And, you know, interesting going back a couple years ago, if for whatever reason, most investors just didn't think there was a whole heck of a lot of uncertainty. The certainty was that the Fed had your back, right? So I'm curious, what was the impetus for writing this piece now? Because it seemed that the market sentiment shifted from 2022 to 2023. When you look at stocks in particular, how much they were up off of their October lows. And there was just this kind of notion that the bear market was over. And and I really thought that the timing of your piece was really interesting, especially when Fed Chair Powell on the Hill this week just added a whole heck of a lot more uncertainty to the rate outlook for the balance of this year. And I think why now? It's something that's troubled me for a number of years. I've been in this business for such a long time. And I guess I've seen both sides of the marketplace like a lot of you guys have. I mean, we've all been around a 
long time. We've seen markets go up. We've seen them go down. And I guess the conventional wisdom of thought is that passive investing, you can never go wrong if you look historically. You know, but the difference in today's world is people's time horizons are a lot different. Their leverage needs are completely different. When you look at credit card debt at just at record levels, you look at mortgage rates at record levels of debt, all these different record levels of debt. So the old adage that you could buy, hold and never lose, I think is still holds true, but there's a different component to it. And that is all the debt associated with the individuals where their time horizon was supposed to be five to 10 years on purchasing a stock or whatever investment they made. But because of the way the economies are and the leverage that they have within their own household, that timing gets changed. And if that timing gets changed, well, that might mean that you don't not only realize your profit on that particular buy and hold trade, you lose money on that buy and hold trade. And I think there's a lot of participants who have just taken the adage that you can never lose by every down tick you've ever seen. You look at the average person participating in the market today, probably in their 40s or 50s, most of those people didn't really participate in the market in 08 and never really saw a downtick. They just saw every downtick and needed to be bought. Now I think that there's a ton more uncertainty into it, mostly due to the leverage that's in the system, leverage in every single household. And people's horizons of time are a lot different than when Warren Buffett would say, buy a stock and you can't lose. So he's correct to some degree. Historically, it's hard to refute that. But your horizon in today's world is so much different. And my point of writing it is that time horizon might be in minutes, not in years now. So you got to be really careful how you manage your risk and and just understand that everything doesn't go up forever. You know, that that was really the purpose of why now. I just really want to have a whole new world of investors that are coming to the market, hopefully reading something like that and taking a pause and understanding that there are two sides to the market because we want younger people involved, but we don't want to sell them. Them on something that is not true, which is they have an instant gratification mentality today. And if you're going to put them into the equity markets or other markets today, they are going to blow themselves up. So I'm just trying to create awareness that there are two sides to the market. Be mindful of that. There are ways to mitigate your risk. And that's why the why now. Terry, you opened up by saying rates are obviously one of the biggest, most important input factors in everything. And it's such a financialized economy here, obviously. And so question is, you just kind of alluded to auto loans, mortgages, student loans are out there, right? These things are very volatile. And the plumbing in the system is starting to back up a little bit as rates move higher. I think there's a lack of sophistication and people obviously understanding that that haven't seen it. Are the banks participating less and less because their inability to take this kind of risk given regulation? Are you seeing that? Because there is so much volatility, which is great for you guys in the rate market specifically. I mean, we're 20 basis point move, 30 basis point moves in a day on what are very liquid security. So you can see the inner workings. We can't. Like, how do you explain which is great for you guys in terms of volatility, that type of volatility on an asset, especially rates, which is such an important input. If the banks are participating less and less, I I guess I would be a little bit surprised, Danny. I think that they can also flourish in these times of the high vol in there because they do have people chasing it. I think where their concern lies is in the buy and hold or the, the sell and hold type of risk assets that are sitting on the books of the dealers. And that's probably got a bigger concern to them with leverage associated with it. But, you know, I think when you look at these rate markets, um, um, hey, they're, they're frightening, right? I mean, they, they are big and they are moving and they are waiting for nobody, no matter what direction they go. So I don't think the banks are taking a less and less of an approach. I think they're taking a more calculated approach. Uh, approach to what business they want to take and what business they don't want to take. And and that's kind of where I see really the bank trade going right now. Because if I look at my bank trade, Danny, and I look at my top open interest holders, which are positions held open on the CME, my top holders are the six largest banks in the world holding record open interest here at CME. So they are participating in the risk management. So I'm not seeing that as much on my end as people might be seeing it on different venues. But from our standpoint, they have really stepped up and they have massive positions on here at CME. Dan mentioned it was a great piece in the Financial Times. And respectfully, you probably could have written this piece at any period of time over the last six to nine months, but you wrote it when you did. And this is just me sort of speculating a bit because you feel there's an opportunity now where people will listen. Because I say that because when markets go up every single day and everybody thinks there's a genius, you write something like this, it's going to fall on deaf ears. This is a quote. 
Scores of novice investors flocked into the markets with the belief that buying every dip was a masterclass strategy to guarantee profit. That's understandable. When there is only upside, it's easy to be fooled into thinking flash can replace knowledge and that gimmicks can substitute for discipline. Now, that's been true for a long time. But I think, again, I'm speaking for you, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. You see this period of time is here's a window where writing this will not fall on deaf ears. This will resonate with people given what's going on. Can you speak to that? I can. And the reason I wrote it that way, Guy, is because when you looked what happened in 2022, when you saw the meltdown of an asset class that people didn't even know what it was, which was crypto, and the massive meltdown in crypto was amazing. When you saw the sell-off in the equity markets happen in 2022, a lot of people just never could imagine something like that even happening before. So The reason I wrote it now is because the opportunities of the markets that have been moving the way they have has been extraordinary. We had the first boots on the ground war in Europe since World War II with Ukraine and Russia. Tell me a trader that's alive today that saw that activity. There isn't any, is my point. And when you look at what's going on between China and Taiwan, there's a lot of animosity that could cause a lot of issues. What does that mean for Mark? The crypto, what I just referenced a moment ago, where people thought that they had FOMO, they had to continue to make sure they participated in that. And then who saw all these rate hikes? in a single year. I don't know anybody that saw it. I mean, I've been calling for rate hikes for years because I felt that the Fed had the opportunity to do so in times where it would have been less disruptive. And also, I'm a big believer that the reason I wrote it is I think that politics are coming into the decisions of the Federal Reserve. Now, that's a hard statement to make because I'm a big fan of Jay Powell's and I think he's done a really good job. But The point is, Guy, politics has had an influence with the Fed for a number of years, and they're not supposed to. Just watch the hearings yesterday and today. So you had the senator from Georgia, Mr. Warnock, suggesting that the Fed chair should not raise interest rates because people can't buy homes. Well, that's not the Fed's problem. The Fed's problem has a mandate, and it's a pretty simple one. You had to keep repeating it. But the undue influence that's happening from politics on the Fed troubles me. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write Now, I think there's so many factors that are going on in the world, especially throughout 2022 and the beginning of 2023. I've never seen it before. I've said this to my own team. I've never seen so many things line up in the world at one single time that like I saw in 2022. And I think it's time for people just to call it out that, hey, you can take advantage of this or you can deploy a strategy that your neighbor thought was a good one or do your own homework and participate in the marketplace in in a responsible way. So I just think the timing was right because of all the fundamental factors that were going on in the world. Terry, one of the issues in 2009 was that the regulators truly did not understand the products in the market, the leverage in the system, and they were caught off guard. And we were caught less off guard, but we were still caught off guard at the depth of the problem, you know, when it went to Lehman and so forth and how much leverage was in the system. This time around, as we do things, and I know you guys market the products, but as we make the transition from LIBOR to SOFR and the reverse repo facility continues to grow, is there something out there that makes you nervous or is there something that you're trying to get the regulators to understand that you think they're just kind of asleep on? Not really, Danny. I think when you looked at the transition from you know, LIBOR to SOFR, I think there's a lot of people that thought this could never be effectuated just because of the sheer size of the amount of products benchmarked to LIBOR. But we've been able to do that. We've been able to transition you know, 90 plus percent of the market to SOFR. We have some tough legacy contracts that'll roll off in April under the default rules that we have here at CME and others will have. And then we all know come June that LIBOR goes away and that's it. So I think from a perspective of the regulators not getting something, not really. I think, you know, you referenced 2008, Denny, and you think about the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. One of the things that people hate and markets hate is the uncertainty, especially of regulation. And when I looked at Dodd-Frank, even though it was voted on in 2010, you know, we are here 13 years later and the rule writers or the regulators are still trying to interpret some of these rules that Congress voted on in 2010 because they haven't implemented 100% of Dodd-Frank. So the uncertainty of regulation, I think, is what's 
really difficult for the participants in the marketplace. So that's more what I see is just uncertainty. And we're probably going to get more of it. If you look at the way the world's going, people are going to be scratching their heads on how do we create different sets of revenue? How do we make things more fair or less fair? Whatever they think is the problem for market participants. And do they try to create new rules associated with the way we do business here in the U.S. to conform maybe with the way people do business in Asia or Europe? I I hope that's not the case because I think they could destroy markets real quickly. Not only do you run the largest futures exchange on the planet, you also traded on it for a while, right? And so you have a market mind. You're not just a manager and you just articulated just your, obviously your comfortability talking about regulation and all those sorts of things. But we love talking markets here and we love talking markets with you. And so when we think about, you know, what is going on right now, really over the last year, the pace in which the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates are going to be over 5% in the Fed funds. And the last time we saw a Fed funds over 5%, was in the lead up to the financial crisis, right? They were raising rates aggressively. They got over 5%. They held them there. And then that was really similar to what happened in late 90s, right? In 1999, I think mid-year, they got Fed funds over 6% and then they held them there. Interestingly, about 99 and 06, we also had a 210 yield curve inversion, right? And we know what happened in 2000 and we know what happened in 2007. The S&P 500 topped out, right? And then in both instances, peak to trough, we saw a 55% ish decline on average between the two of them. So you think about what's going on right now. We're going to have, again, Fed funds 5%. We've had the yield curve inversion at its widest level in 40 years or so. What are your thoughts here? Because, I mean, we could say that it's different this time and, and there's a whole host of folks that might think about that. I'm just curious from your history as a market participant, but now also as someone running a huge exchange and seeing, again, going back to what we started this conversation, all the ways in which different individuals and market participants are hedging risk, does it feel like we're on the precipice of something? Yes. I think to try to draw the conclusion that history on an inverted yield curve will produce the effects it did in history in today's world is a tough one only because of what I said earlier. The things that happened, and I don't need to tell Danny Moses this, what happened in 07, 08, and 09, you know, was a leveraged housing bubble. What I think we're seeing today is a leveraged retail community, for a lack of a better term. So all institutional is retail, right? Us in small individuals give money to somebody else and they give it to somebody else, but it's got to come from somewhere. And everybody that's invested in large institutions, they got a lot of leverage associated with them. So I think this time might be a little bit different of the bad behavior of leverage in the system of 08. I think it's the everyday leverage that, you know, here, whether it's $31 trillion in national debt, you know, I mean, think about that. And then there's a statement made by the Fed yesterday when asked, are you concerned about servicing that debt level with these higher interest rates. And he didn't miss a beat. He said, no. Now, I think most people went, how could you not be concerned with that? I think a lot of people don't understand that most of that debt's priced at zero. You know, there's only a handful of debt priced at these higher levels. So, of course, he, you know, it's an easy answer, but he didn't explain it the way he did. But I do think that from a trader's perspective, I think the scenario is different with the inversion of the yield curve, Dan. And, and I think that here, there's two things. The Fed's raising rates because of something that the government created in and of itself. It sprinkled down trillions of dollars to people that weren't working to buy products that weren't available. So they created their own inflationary scenario. Now, historically, the Fed's mandate is to get people to work, but now they're trying to take them out of work. So it is the most perverse situation I've ever seen in my entire life. So we're trying to raise rates to take to make unemployment go up so in return we could have inflation go down and i think if even danny moses would probably agree that if you presented that situation in 2008 him and some of his partners even would have giggled at that one like really what that's what they're trying to do that sounds so perverse just in and of itself. But that's what we're seeing now. So the question is, how do you participate in the market with those kind of fundamental factors out there. And I think it's the most interesting time in the history of the world, especially in markets, because it creates a whole new opportunity for participants to manage risk, trade risk, and, and be, as I said in my piece, I think there's a place for not only passive, but active people 
to grow their businesses if they do it in the right way by using multiple products to do so. Totally agree. This is the most confusing slash opportunistic environment to trade ever. And I sense from your op-ed, and while I know the banks are large participants from an open interest perspective, they probably should be trading, quote, more. But I don't think they even know how to hedge their mortgage book right now, how to hedge some of their client risks that they have on the balance sheet. And if you showed me every single chart except the S&P 500, I would say the S&P 500 was near 3,000. I say that as an arbitrary place, but when I look at how not broken things are, but where things stand right now, and the one thing I would add to the comment that you made is the extra thing here is this QT. And while they're not really doing QT, I mean, the amount of <laughs> the amount of stuff being pulled from the market's not a lot. So they say they're doing something, but if you look on a monthly basis, it's not as big. But the moral hazard that was created, I believe, is creating the why people are so passive. The belief of this generation of traders, right? And it's been 13, 14 years since this stuff has really mattered to think the Fed has your back. And I believe that they're completely trapped. And when I say trapped, if they try to do anything, it will exacerbate inflation. And then all hell's going to break loose. So that's what I sense from you in reading the op-ed is that people should be asking more questions and be more active and be more proactive. And it just feels like what is it going to take to get these people off of the sideline and these participants to come in? I mean, you had a record quarter, February, you guys reported record, record, record. You are in the sweet spot and you obviously see that people are missing this opportunity. I do think they're missing this opportunity, but I think what's going to get them to change is defaults. And I think when you saw the defaults in the housing market in 08, you could start to see other defaults, whether it be on student loan debt, credit card debt or other debt. People have gotten to a point where they believe the Fed doesn't have to have your back anymore. The United States government's got your back now. And that's a really bad place to be if you're a government, because that's a spigot that could get turned off in a heartbeat. And what people are not focused on, Danny, and I am, I'm focused on the debt ceiling and I'm focused on the election of a speaker that took 15 rounds before its own party could have a consensus to put a man in with basically nobody running against him. What do you think those people are going to want come debt ceiling time? Everybody says, well, when we have the vote on the debt ceiling in two 2011, I think it was an hour before the clock ran out, they struck a deal. Think about the people that were in Congress in 2011. Let's think about the people that are there today. You think this guy Santos gives a shit about going back to his constituents and saying he voted against something? He didn't know why he's there. I mean, we have a whole different group of people in there that are going to want a lot of things in order for their vote. They wanted a ton of things in order to vote for a speaker. Can you imagine what they believe they're going to be able to extract from the president and the Democrats on cost cuttings as if for their vote in order for the Americans to be able to pay their bills. I think it's going to be a fascinating summer coming up for markets and people are not paying attention to that. Why? Because we always come to a resolution. Buckle up. I don't think we're going to come to a resolution this year. Terry, you made the comment earlier that, you know, this market's all been about immediate gratification and people literally trade by the hour, by the day. And they think that they've either, oh, I got that right. I got that wrong. And that's part of this kind of retail investor meme stock phenomenon that's gone on that was exacerbated during COVID and the stay at home and, and all of that. So changing that mentality is going to be really important. Do you think it's just a downward move in the stock market that just hits the, the confidence of the retail consumer that makes this self-fulfilling that, yes, it'll be too late when the S&P goes down 25, 30% if that does happen, God forbid? Is there a level that you're kind of looking at? Not really, Danny. I try not to focus on that. I just kind of focus on what I think is the competition for the market. And the market has got a new competitor in the Fed with the rates and a lot of stocks that are yielding nothing or yielding a hope and a prayer and a promise to deliver something in the future. I think that the Fed is that alternative. And, you know, I, I, that's just an opinion I have as far as how the people are looking at the markets going into these higher rate environment. The obsession with the Fed is a sideshow to me in the sense of, yes, it's an important input, but trading every data point, you know, every market up, market down based upon a word that Powell says. Powell changes his tune every other meeting. And that really was a Fed meeting these last two days that he was testifying in front of Congress. I mean, that was a Fed press conference. I mean, that's the same as what he does. So on that stance, you know, in that moment of people trading like that, I think they're losing the forest through the trees because You've pointed out, and I've pointed out, we've pointed out in this podcast before, there's other things happening, whether it's the debt ceiling, which is not relevant to the Fed, whether it's employment, which only has one direction to go at some point, right? We're going to start accelerating unemployment at some point. So I feel like at some point, the Fed will be in the backdrop and fundamentals 
will matter. I think that's when the tipping point will be. Fundamentals always win out, um, but they don't always win out, Danny, when you have an unlimited pocketbook supporting bad fundamentals. And that's my point. When you can have the government instead of the Fed being your backstop, you can stay in a bad position for a lot longer than you could without a backstop, whether it's the Fed or the government. You know, I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money being wrong to market. And I've seen a lot of people lose money being right to market. It's called timing. That was back when we all used to trade. Now we have a situation where we have governments basically backstopping trades for people because they're willing to give out massive amounts of money for everything else that you traditionally would be paying for yourself. So I look at it in a different realm. Terry, you're about 18 months into a 10-year relationship with Google. They invested a billion dollars in CME Group. You probably have some great clarity, visibility, metrics, whatever word you want to use in terms of how that relationship is going. Uh, Talk to us about that. Guy, I'll tell you, it's a really interesting business proposal that we've done here with Google because you learn so much. You know, we all know a lot about what's going on with artificial intelligence. We all know a lot what's going on with machine learning. We all know a lot what's going on with cyber. As I'm moving a lot of our products, especially back office products. So I'm moving market data, clearing things of that nature into the cloud. Each and every day, you know, you got multiple applications that you got to work through to move this stuff into the cloud. I've learned a lot about some of the services that Google has. And, you know, this recent cyber attack on Ion that affected some of the client base in my world, not CME, but some of the client base, you you get a real appreciation for the cybersecurity investment that somebody's cloud could providers can do. And for me, that's really important. You know, when you're under a proprietary system, you have so many dollars that you could use because you're running an entire business. You can allocate towards different things. And, you know, that is their business, whether it's Google or somebody else. So to me, I'm really excited by that. But just the the pure efficiencies of a single point of contact from my clients, ultimately, and the savings that could be passed back on to the users to create more users to that marketplace is good for the whole ecosystem. So I'm really excited excited by it. And after you know less than two short years, I've learned a lot about what I think the efficiencies could be for my participants. And for me, I'm very excited by it. Let's finish with this because Guy mentioned it. You broke the internet. You came on a podcast. It's not something you do a whole heck of a lot. You shared an exchange with us back in November and that you had had, I think in the prior spring with Sam Bankman-Fried. One year ago next week. We were sitting there, jaws open as you're telling us this story. And we couldn't wait for the podcast to come out and you came on CNBC's Fast Money and you, you kind of talked about it a little bit with us and Melissa Lee. And it was just amazing because there were so few people, whether they were investors or advisors or counterparties. I mean, the list went on and on and on. And it seemed that there was plenty of breadcrumbs, that there was something amiss there. But you set it to his face in the spring of 2022. You set it in front of Congress later that spring. Why was no one listening to you back then? And were you surprised Surprise that you telling this story in November, really before this thing started bubbling up, before people started turning on him, that it caught as much steam as it did? Well, yes and no. I guess the steam came from him doing the perk walk and then everybody trying to understand why is this man doing a perk walk that was supposed to be walking on water and not walking with his hands behind his back and a set of cuffs. So I think why people were so intrigued by Sam and maybe be FTX is if you sit with him, he can talk for two hours and he's very legible, but you haven't a clue what he said. And I think a lot of people fell victim to his shtick, for lack of a better term. And everybody got hell bent on understanding that we don't want to be left behind in the innovation world. So this is innovation. It's in a mandate from the government that we will always look at innovation. And you know what? I'm all for innovation, as I said to you guys before, but my whole concern was that nobody was prepared to write rules for this new form of innovation and risk management. They were just willing to let it go forward. And and I could not understand that, but I think it goes to the salesperson who was explaining it to him. And there's no secret the amount of money 
that this man spent what appears to be client money on political contributions to anybody with an elected office held that you could see that people can be influenced by this. Um, you know, we I saw this back when Tom DeLay was uh, in charge where he would beat up on K Street and whatever the new thing was, fast money. You know, and I don't want to mean fast money as in your show. I'm talking about fast money coming into Washington, trying to influence the decisions of Congress. And I was a bit surprised that after the last go around, especially with the housing crisis, that Congress kind of fell for this trap a little bit again. And it really did surprise me, Dan. So I think people really wanted to give up the risk management and the oversight for the sake of innovation, not understanding what that innovation could do to a system. So, you know, I'm all for it. It, right, right rules associated with it. And none of us have any complaints because we're all part of the process. But for somebody to come in and just decide this is the way the new world order is going to be and make it applicable to all markets, even though he was only saying crypto was just wrong because that wasn't the case. He was trying to apply it to every single market. And I don't know if any of us would be sitting here right now today talking about this. We might have been talking about how small the 2008 housing crisis was compared to what he just did if he would have deployed his model. And that's what I was trying to put forth the Congress. You know, the day or two before I testified, USD Tierra lost 85% of its value on, on its uh, stable coin. And I s said that FTT, Sam's coin, could do this same exact thing if they deploy this model. And I had people look at me like, are you, are you stupid? How could that happen? I'm thinking, well, maybe I am stupid. So I tried to learn more about it. And then I got berated by Ro Khanna. You know who the first call I got was after Sammy Boy went for a walk? Ro Khanna. So when Ro Khanna called me, and I, if he hears this, he probably won't be happy I'm telling a story, but I'll tell it anyway. He called me. My team said that, you know, Congressman Connor wants to talk to you. I said, well, I'm busy. I don't want to talk to him. I said, you know what? Never mind. If he's available, tell him to call me right now and I'll take his call. So we talked for 15, 20 minutes and he said, I don't know how you saw this coming. I don't know how I missed it. Sorry about the way I acted, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the conversation, he said, Terry, if there's anything I could ever do for you, please call me. And I paused and I said, Congressman, can I tell you something? He goes, oh, yeah, sure, sure. I said, I will never call you. I will never, ever call you. But if you ever need anything, here's my personal cell. You can call me anytime. But that's kind of how the mentality was around some of the, the antics of crypto. And listen, I actually think there could be a future, but let's do it the right way and not do it the wrong way, because I don't want the Danny Moses trade of 2008 to be considered a small trade in the future. I love what you did there. Very Marlon Brando, Vito Corleone, by the way. And I know there's a part of you that embraces the Sicilian heritage. But listen, I'll say this before we get out of here. You tried to warn people about John Corzine. Nobody listened until it was too late. Then it was too late. And you clearly tried to do the same thing with this character. Nobody listened until it was too late. So I hope next time they haul your ass up there, they listen to you. And Terry, so once again, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you. Obviously, thanks to CME Group for everything they do for Risk Reversal Media. Look forward to speaking to you again, Terry. Guy, Dan, Danny, thank you very much. Thanks once again to CME Group, iConnections, and SoFi for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find the show, and we love hearing from you. You can also email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. Yeah.